Well, let me just start by saying Merry Christmas to all of you guys who are joining in, uh, those of you at our Northgate campus, uh, at our Madras campus, and those of you watching online. We're so glad you're here joining in. I hope you guys uh, have a great holiday season. I also want to just take uh, just a minute and say thank you, uh, just, just to stop for a second and say thanks, because you guys have done such uh, an outstanding job. Uh, you always do around this time of year, uh, but especially through our Christmas in Coweta uh, project that we just finished up this past week. Uh, you guys did so much, and you brought so much joy to so many uh, kids in our county. And uh, every time people talk to me about uh, my church and they want me to tell them about my church, this is the part that I love talking about. I'm, I'm always so proud to talk about the generosity that you guys always show every year uh, through our Do Something projects, Thanksgiving, and right on up through Christmas. Uh, and then, of course, all throughout the year, the support that you provide to, to, uh, to alleviate poverty around our county and in Haiti. Again, just thank you so much for all that you've done. It has been just a tremendous season around here these days. But as you know, we're in a series right now. We're calling it Love Story. And we almost decided to call the series the season of love because, you know, we put it right smack dab in the middle of the Christmas holiday season. But we decided to go with Love Story, and we did that because what we're really talking about in this whole series is what is an uh, essential mark of following Jesus. And the essential mark of following Jesus is love. So for the last week, three weeks, we've talked about this statement that Jesus made. He said, by the way that you love each other, by the way that uh, you, you live a life of love, people are going to know that you're my disciples or that you're my followers. In other words, by the way your life essentially becomes a love story, Jesus said you sharing God's love with the people all around you, that's how the world will know that you're a follower of mine. So here we are now, and it's the Sunday before Christmas. And, and you know as well as I do, and we all want this, Christmas ought to be about love, right? That, that's what the whole season ought to be about. But the fact is, it gets complicated sometimes, and it doesn't always revolve around that. It gets so junked up with other stuff. And, and, and if you have a lot of kids or the more kids you have, you know that it gets more complicated the more kids you have because it gets junked up with even more stuff. And if, if you have family that you go and you see at, at the holiday times, that, that makes it more complicated because you have all of that stuff going on, and it gets busy. If you have family that lives outside of, of town and you have to drive somewhere to, to take your family to, to spend Christmas, it gets complicated there. If there's been a divorce somewhere in your family, Christmas gets complicated there because, you know, People start bringing people into your house that you don't even know or maybe you don't even like, and it gets complicated. And, and this whole thing of Christmas just becomes this hurried, hectic, complicated time of year for a lot of us. And, and I wish there was something I could do about that. Honestly, there's, there's not much I can do to help you on that front. But the part that I come to hate the most around this time of year is, is that often people not only complicate the season, they complicate the message. We complicate the whole idea of Christmas, and, and, and this ties into what we're talking about because, again, we're talking about the heart of Christianity. And so today, as we're all wishing each other a Merry Christmas and we're singing the Christmas songs at all of our campuses, I just want us to get real clear. I want to make sure that the message of Christmas, that's not what gets complicated in your mind uh, around this time. Now, the story of Christmas, it, it shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be complicated, but the truth is... It, it is, and, and it's become that way over time. And, and here's the thing. It, it wasn't our culture that complicated Christmas, although we like to blame the culture a lot of times. And, and it wasn't those people that you blame for wanting to take Christ out of Christmas. It wasn't their fault that Christmas got so complicated. It's not even your fault. It, it's, not, it's not your fault. It, mostly, I'll just say this. When the message of Christmas got complicated, it was the fault of people like me. <laughs> It was preacher's fault. It was the church's fault. So today, I want to I clear that up. I, wanna, I want us to take this simple story, and I want us to get right at the message of Christmas. Now, the message of Christmas comes way early in the story uh, in your Bible. And even if you don't come to church much, and you, you probably know this story that we're going to read to you today. In fact, uh, you've heard this. I've heard this. We hear this every year. In fact, 
Uh, maybe you came to church at Christmas time when you were a kid and you, you heard somebody read this story. Or if you're like me, my family's tradition is around Christmas time we sit down and we watch the Charlie Brown Christmas special. That, that's my favorite tradition these days, watching Charlie Brown with my, my kids. And, and I, I love it because it comes to the end part. And Linus walks out on stage and the spotlight comes on and, and he reads that Christmas. Or he recites the Christmas story. And, and, and that, to me, that's just the best part of it. And, and, and you probably heard it that way, you know. Shepherds are out in the field watching their flock by night. And lo, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. I mean, some of us can say it by heart. Well, the fact is, there's a little part of that story that we often read that I think gets overlooked, and, and it gets junked up and complicated, and it didn't have to be that way, but it is. And I want to read some of it to you. So we're going to read that, this little part of the Christmas story and talk about it a little bit. Here's, here's that. Here's what I want you to read. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, to which I got to think the shepherds thought, oh, of course we're not afraid because angels show up and talk to us every night. Why would we be afraid? Ha <laughs> ha. But no, he says, don't be afraid. And here's the phrase I want, you to, I want you to focus on. Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. It's that little phrase, good news. It's, 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 it's where we get the word you may have heard this word before, gospel. That, that word simply just means good story, the gospel, the good news, the good story. The angels say, we're going to tell you a good story, and it's going to bring great joy. For Look at that again. For who? All people. Not just you Jewish shepherds sitting out here in this field. Not for the Romans that are back in town. Not for the rich people. Not for just the poor people. It's good news for all people. And what is the good news? He says, today. In the town of David, a Savior is born to you, Christ the Lord. And here's, here's what I want to make sure that you hear real clearly today. If there's any part of the message of Christianity, and when you hear it, it doesn't strike you as good news. Can I just say to you, maybe someone told it to you wrong. <laughs> or maybe you got the wrong message. Or maybe you just misunderstood See, if there's anything about the church or, or in your part of or in part of your history and it doesn't strike you as good news, then listen, perhaps somebody distorted it. Perhaps you've gotten a poor characterization of what the church is all about. See, if your husband or your wife walked in tomorrow and said to you, Honey, I've got good news, you wouldn't immediately think, Oh great, here we go again. Or, oh, great, what do I have to do this time? I mean, if somebody you trust or somebody you love tells you, I've got some good news for you. You don't think about, oh, what am I going to have to do? Or, or, or what is it going to cost me? You think about, oh, this must be something that's going to be helpful to me. This is something that I want to hear. This is something I've been waiting for. I mean, when somebody says, hey, I've got good news, when it's not said in some little twisted sales pitch way, you think I'm about to hear some great information. Good news means here's an opportunity that will make your life better. Good news means there's something that you, you aren't going to have to do that you thought you might have to do, that you didn't want to. Good news says your teacher just canceled the exam and we're all going to get A's. That's good news. Good news is, hey, your mother-in-law called. She's not coming for Christmas. <laughs> I, I don't know. Whatever good news sounds like to you, something like that. I, I don't know what it sounds like to you, but here's what I do know. When you hear good news. Your first thought is not, oh, here's what that's going to cost me, or here's what I'm going to have to give up. When the good story of Jesus began in the very beginning, when the love story of all love stories started, when God sent his son to the world, the angel said, this is good news. It's going to bring great joy for all people. Because the message of Christianity is 100% good news. And listen, if your feelings about God or if your feelings about Jesus or your feelings about his church are less than that, can I just say, on behalf of, of all of us Christians, I, I apologize because somehow, some way, I don't know how, 
but somebody gave you the message wrong. They took the love story and they messed it up for you. And I'm so sorry about that. See, if it's good news, I tell you what the core message isn't, which a lot of a lot of people think it is. The core message, if it's good news, it can't possibly be this. It can't possibly be, hey, straighten up. I bring you good news for great joy. It will be to all the people. Okay, what is it? You better straighten up. (laughs) That doesn't sound like good news. Thou shalt not. Quit sinning. God's mad at you. That's not good news. In fact, (laughs) that's not even news. (laughs) You didn't need anybody to tell you that. You knew that already. In fact, every religious system says straighten up. Here's what you've got to do to make God happy. Folks, that's not good news. It's not even news. So see, what I want to do today is I want to try and go back and explain to you why would the angel say that this is good news? Why would would we put this series, Love Story, in the middle of, of the story of Christmas? And what does it all have to do with each other? Now, here's how we're going to go about this today. One of the very first followers of Jesus is a man named John. In fact, John became such a close follower of Jesus that Uh, Jesus put a lot of trust into John. And and if you don't know the story, at the very end of Jesus' life, when Jesus is dying on the cross, John is there, and so is Jesus' mother. And Jesus looks at John, and he says, John, I want you to take care of my mom when I'm gone. Now listen, you've got friends, you've got acquaintances, you've got even some very close friends, but who would say that to someone? I mean, that, that shows a lot of love and a lot of trust between the two of them, and that's what happened. Jesus asked John to take care of his mother, and John did it. In fact, we... We're pretty certain he took that very seriously. In fact, history records for us that John did take it seriously. In fact, he, he, he took Mary in as his own mom. He, they moved to a city called Ephesus. In fact, you can visit it today. It's in modern-day Turkey. And if you go there, you can visit the house where John and Jesus' mother lived, where he took care of her. So John walked with Jesus. He heard him teach. He saw him do miracles. He saw him die. And then three days later, he ran to a tomb and found it empty. And then later after that, he had a meal with the resurrected Jesus. And so John, this close follower of Jesus, once he got old, he decided, I want to write down as many of the stories about Jesus that I remember. So he writes down this account of Jesus' life. It's become what we know today in our Bibles as the Gospel of John. And you can read it. It's in your Bible. What I want us to do today is we're going to look at part of that book in the Bible. And we're going to look at a statement that John makes after he writes an account about Jesus and a religious leader named Nicodemus. You may have heard this story before. In fact, if you read all the way to the end of the book, you'll find out John is he's so adamant about this whole story of Jesus. He, he talks about Jesus, and he, at the end of his book, he goes on this rant. It's kind of like a joy rant of why Jesus came into the world. And he says, he says, look, I need you to know why I wrote all this down, this whole book. He says, I didn't write this so you'd know a lot of stuff about Jesus. In fact, if, if I tried to do that, if I tried to write everything Jesus did, I wouldn't even have enough paper for it. He says, I'm writing so that when you read these stories about Jesus, you'll believe that Jesus is who he says he was. And at the end of this particular account where Jesus talks about this, or John writes about this, uh, uh, this account between uh, this interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus, right at the end, he, he blurts out this extraordinary statement. In fact, this is the most famous statement that John writes in his book. In fact, I, I believe it quite possibly is the most famous statement written in all of the Bible. It's a statement that you probably know no matter how much Bible you know or don't know. This might be the very the most popular one of all. And if you came today, and if, if you decide today after you're here today for church, you're never going to come back. And if you decided you don't want to follow Jesus, which, again, is, is your choice, I just, here's what I want to do today. I just want to tell you about what you're deciding not to be a part of. Because I think that's fair for you to know. And, and I don't know why you stayed away from Jesus or church or Christianity. Maybe you never knew this or... Maybe you stayed away because you had a bad church experience. Maybe you stayed away because you know some Christians or you've done business with some Christians or maybe you married one and and you're thinking, I don't ever want to have anything to do with that because you've had a really bad experience. And I just want to say to you, I get it. In fact, if I had the same experiences you had, I'd probably feel the same way you would. Honestly, I would. But I just want you to know, if you choose not to be a follower of Jesus today, you're choosing not to embrace what you have to admit is some pretty good news. 
So John writes this book. He writes this uh, account about Jesus and Nicodemus, and then he writes this most popular phrase, this most popular statement. Here it is. You all know it. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave. God so loved the world that he did what people who love people do. (laughs) He gave. God loved the world so much that he did for the world what you're going to do for the people you love this week. He gave. That's good news. Now let me tell you something about how the people who first read that would have heard it because to some degree you and I can't hear it the same way that they did in that day because if you aren't a Christian, even if you aren't a Christian, you have some ideas about what God is just because of the culture that we live in. We all have a sense of God is love and he loves people and all that kind of stuff. That's sort of built into our, our modern culture in America. But to the Greek and the Roman people who first heard this verse from John, their culture was completely different. Their culture taught gods didn't love people. Their gods didn't. I mean, if you were to write a pagan version of that verse for their culture, it would say something like this. For God so loved himself that people had to pay to, for God, what God wanted. Because that's what they believed about gods. I mean, study Greek and Roman mythology sometime. Jupiter, Zeus, and all that stuff. Those gods don't love people. They played with people. They, they killed innocent children. They, they, they just operated by fate, you know. Some people in their, their culture would do good, and some people didn't. They would get sick, and they would die. And it was because of the gods. That's what they wanted. That was their culture. Every country had their own set of gods. And if we beat your country, it means our god's better than your god. So our god is bigger. And, 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 and in that day... Rome was ruling the world, and so their gods were supreme. And John thinks back on all of his encounters with Jesus, and he thinks about this encounter with Nicodemus, and he's, he speaks into that culture. He says, no, 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 not, it's not like all the gods that you've been taught about. God so loves the world that he gave his only son. God gives what's most valuable to him. He gives his son, and then his son Jesus continues on in the likeness of his father, and he gives his life for this world that God loves. Now, here's the thing. If you just put a period on that part of the story, if you just sort of ended it right there, God so loved the world, therefore he gave his only son, and you just said, that's it, end of story. It's still good news, isn't it? It's remarkable. I mean, think about it. It's remarkable to think that this this world that is so incredibly beautiful and complex, it's remarkable to think that the creator of all of this loved us people so much that he would give his only son for us period end of story isn't that amazing by itself (laughs) but john he looks back and he adds words to it he said god so loved the world he gave his one and only son and then he says now we are invited because he says that whoever and what he means by that is red yellow black white whoever it doesn't matter from the child who is innocent and and doesn't even know better that that's just naive and innocent from that young child all the way to a 70 year old man or a woman with a lifetime full of sin doesn't matter whoever everyone no distinction whether gentile or roman or or jew or a slave or a man or a woman or a child it doesn't matter no distinctions whoever and the good news just gets better he says whoever believes in him now, this is where you really have to pay attention because this is so vital. Please don't miss this. This, this will get kind of kind of maybe a little complicated, but hang on because if you miss the rest of it, you've got to hit this part. Don't miss this. I want you to get this. You've seen this statement, and some of you have memorized this verse as kids, but some of us are still missing this part of the verse. Here's what's so important. John writes, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever, and then it's like, it's almost as if John has to come up with a word. It's like he needs to figure out a way to say this part. So he chooses a very common Greek word in his day. It's the word pistuo. Pistuo. It, 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 that word just means believe, okay? It, but When he writes that word, John knows that's not enough. That's not really what I want to say because John doesn't want us to think believe as in like when you say, oh, I believe in love or I believe George Washington lived one day. That's that's not what he means. He needs something more than that. So John then, after he writes that word believe, pastuo, he writes a preposition on the end of it to kind of go with it. In fact, a lot of scholars believe this is the very first time in the entire Greek language that these two words were put together first time ever it's like John needs to invent a brand new word so he takes a preposition 
And, and the preposition means into. It means toward. It, it was the word that you would use to say something like, I'm going to lean toward something or I'm going to lean into something. It's the little word. It's, it, the word is ace in, in their language. Pistuo ace. It, and he puts it right together. So it, it creates this whole new idea. It's kind of like saying believe toward something or believe into or to lean into something. Because, see, in the Greek language, they didn't have a word for trust. They just had the word believe. And John knows there's more to, to it than this. This is not about you just believing something. It's not like you believing that George Washington was the first president. It's more than that. This is not what God's after. So he takes those two words and he puts them together to describe what God is asking for the world to do in response to his love. And John creates the idea of trust in God. He's saying, Whoever trusts, whoever trusts in, whoever leans toward, whoever moves into. See, this is why around here, and you've, if you've been around for a while, you've seen us use this illustration. It's why we'll talk about uh, belief in God, kind of like me talking about this stool. And, and, and see, for me to, to believe in God or to, to trust Jesus, it, it's like if I say, I, I, I believe this stool. Well, it's one thing for me to say, I believe that the stool is here. Well, of course I do. I believe it's there. And it's one, it's one thing for me to say, I believe that this stool will hold me up if I were to lean on it. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. It's more than even me saying, well, I'll, I'll show you. I'll, I'll lean on it just a little bit, and I'll trust a little in the stool, and I'll trust a little bit in myself. It's more than that. What this word means, it means to put your full weight. It means to fully trust. To trust Jesus plus nothing. To put my whole life, my full weight, onto Jesus and what he's done for me. Nothing else. No backup plan. Not a little of me, not a little of him. But my full weight. This is what it means to trust. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever trusts in, believes in him, shall have. Because, see, God loved, so he gave. We believe and then we receive the thing that he came to give us. So here's what he says. He says, whoever believes in or trusts in him, and here's what he gives, they shall not perish but have eternal life. Now see that phrase, not perish but have eternal life. It, if, if you just read it literally, here's what it means. It just means you, you won't ever stop. <laughs> you won't ever stop going. You, you just keep right on going. That's what it means, literally. It means you won't come to an end. You know, the word perish means something ends. You know, if you talk about uh, your marriage perishing, it means it just ended. It's no more. It doesn't, it's not there anymore. So John says, if you place your trust in God's Son, then you will never cease to be. You will just continue on. You will have this, what he uses this phrase is, eternal life. And see, that phrase, eternal life, that was very common in their day. In fact, everybody wanted to live forever. The emperors all wanted to live forever, so they would just call themselves divine and and that was sort of their way of living forever but 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 if you but God gave but God loved so God gave and then we trust so we receive what God gave and that thing is eternal life now let me explain that a little bit because here's another time when I hope you really pay attention because we get this goofed up a little bit Jesus right near the end of his life he prays this prayer and in this prayer he defines literally what he means by eternal life. See, here, here's the problem. When you hear the words eternal life, if you've grown up around church or if you've been a Christian for any length of time, I know exactly what you think. It, it's what all of us think. We hear the words eternal life and we think, oh, I know what that is. That's heaven one day. When I die, I'm going to heaven. You know, I live this life and then this life ends and then eternal life begins and I get to go to heaven and, and all of that. Did you know that when Jesus used the phrase eternal life, that's not what he meant? Th th it's more to it than that. Now, before you misquote me and, and, and get it all goofed up, let me just say this real clearly. I do believe there's a heaven, and I do believe that if you trust in Jesus, you will go to heaven when you die. What I'm saying is that's not all Jesus was talking about. I want to show you how Jesus defines eternal life because this is part of the good news. John 17, here's what he said. Jesus is praying. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. 
Look at this. He says, For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those that you have given him. Now notice he uses that word we've been talking about, give, right? God loved, so God gave. He says, I give them eternal life. Now look at this next part. He says, now this is eternal life. Okay, so here's where we're getting to it. Jesus is about to tell us, he's about to define eternal life. God lo- Remember, the f- God loved, so God gave. We trust in him, so we receive. But the question is, what do we receive? It's eternal life. What is that? He says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So the question is, what is eternal life? Eternal life is this. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. In fact, if you take the, all those Greek words that they would have used and you tease all that meanings out, what he really is saying literally is that they might be introduced to you, God. That they might come to have an intimate knowledge of you. In other words, it's purely relational. Jesus says, I want to give mankind a knowledge and a relationship with God and his son. In fact, a little bit earlier in his writing about Jesus, John gives us another snapshot of this. All the way back in the very first chapter, he writes, to all who received him, to all who believed in, there it is, believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Watch that phrase. It's another relational phrase. He says, children of God. When you believe in, when you put your trust in, when you put your full weight on Jesus, not just believing about him, not believing a fact, but when you put your weight on him, it means you receive a new right. You receive the right to be a child of God. So again, God loved and God gave. Guys, that's what Christmas is all about. Isn't that what we celebrate this season? I mean, That's it. But there's more. We believe. In other words, we put our trust, we put our weight on him. And when we do, we receive a gift. We become children of God. And that's eternal life. We have a relationship with God. We have a relationship with his son, Jesus. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this and certainly wouldn't ask you to argue with me, but Can I just ask you one question? How's that bad news? I mean, I'm not asking you to believe it. I'm just saying, what I just explained to you, that is the message of Christianity. How in the world is that not good news? And and just in case you missed it, it's like when John writes it, he, he, he wants to make sure we don't miss it, and he adds something to it. There's a verse, it, it comes right after John 3.16. You may have memorized John 3.16, and most people just don't know there's anything after that. There's a verse that comes right after that, and, and it's like John wants to clear it up in case you missed it, in case you didn't hear it the first time. He wants to make sure we get it. I, in case your mom or your dad or some preacher way back in your past told you about what Christianity was about, and, and, and they told you something different, and it didn't sound like good news to you, just in case you got that message. Here's what John adds. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And I hope you've got the implication of that, but if you missed it, let me just say it real plainly. If Christians have ever made you feel condemned, if a church has ever made you feel as if you were condemned, you got the wrong message. And that is not your fault. It was the fault of the messenger. John, who walked and talked with Jesus before and after the resurrection, said it clearly. God didn't send his son into this world to shake his finger in your face. He didn't send his son into this world to tell you how rotten and broken this world is or to tell you what a failure you are and what a sinner you are. Because that's not good news. It's not even news. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn this world. He sent him to save it. Now listen, that word saved, that that does mean that you and I, we need God. It means that we're not okay all on our own. Saved means, it implies that 
I, I'm in trouble without Jesus, but you just need to know something. Remember, I'm not in trouble because God's doing something to me. I'm in trouble because of me. <laughs> I'm in trouble because of my sin for what I've done. But the good news is God loves me. And so he gave. And if I will just believe in, trust in, put my full weight, not, oh, I believe Jesus died on a cross. No. If I trust him with my life, if I believe in him, I can be saved. And saved means I'm rescued. Saved means that I was once separated from God. Now I know God. Saved means I go from wondering what's going to happen to me when I die to I know God is with me now and forever. That's God's love story. God loved, so he gave. We believe in, so we receive life with God. When you put your trust in Jesus, you receive a different kind of life. And that life, starting at this moment, will go on forever. No wonder the angel said, I bring you good news. And it'll bring you great joy. The Savior is born. He's Christ the Lord. Today, I want to call your attention to that connection card that you found in your seat when you came in today. And there's important steps on the back of that card that we take here every week. We want to take next steps in our walk with God. But today, there's one really important one that I want to call your attention to. I want to ask you, has there ever been a time when you put your weight, your full weight on Jesus? Not just believe something about him. Not say a prayer to him. Have you put your full trust in Jesus? If you haven't and, and you're ready to do that today, I just want to invite you. On the right side of that card, on the back there, would you check that box that says, I want to begin a relationship with Jesus? Now listen, checking that box doesn't make you a Christian. Just as praying a prayer doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. The Bible says that the way we show that we have turned our life over to God, that we are putting our full weight on Him, is through our deeds, what we do. We show that. So we're going to contact you. If you check that, we'll contact you. And we'll talk to you about the implications of what that means. The first step, of course, is to be baptized, signifying what God has done in your life. But it also means that that's just the beginning. It means that you begin to live this life right now. You live out eternal life with God, the life every day, the, the life God's given you. And you could start that right now. Others of you here today, you're a Christian. You've been that way for a long time. And maybe that's not your next step. Maybe your next step is, hey, it's time to share this with somebody. I mean, come on, guys. It's Christmas. Share the story that God gave because he loved and now we trust in him, and we receive life. In just a few minutes, we're, we're going to sing one last song that talks about this. And, and then when we're, while we're doing that, we're going to take up those connection cards. You just drop those in the offering, and we'll pray for you. And if, and if appropriate, we'll contact you, and we'll help you in your next steps. Would you bow your heads right now with me as we pray? Father, thank you for the good news that you loved us so much that you gave. You gave the most valuable thing that you had. And now if we will just believe in, we will trust in, we will lean on him, then we'll receive life with you, knowing you, starting now through eternity. God, I pray for every person that is just now coming into that knowledge and they are beginning to put their full weight on you. God, would you lead them, guide them through the steps of making that decision public. And God, for the rest of us, may this be the heart of Christmas. Uncomplicated, uh, not junked up by all the other stuff that comes through our lives at this time of year. But God, may Christmas be about your love story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.